Hello and welcome back to the University of Salford Online. My name is Professor Andy Meir and tonight's event is brought to you as part of the ESRC Festival of Social Science, which has had a, a range of events this year that are all connected to the theme of the environment. And of course, that's also connected to COP26, which is the subject for tonight's discussion. We've had a lot of activity take place over the last two weeks focused on COP26. And the panel that we have tonight comes across from the university in all different departments. And one of the things we've been really keen to do is to make sure that every discipline is able to say something about how they feel about what's going on at COP26, but also how they feel about the climate emergency more widely. So we're going to talk about what's happened. We're going to talk about the week that's happened, but also the fortnight more generally, where COP26 ended up, what more still has yet to be done. And what's also exciting is I think the outcome of our program of work which culminates in this festival of social science is going to lead into a bigger program of work of public engagement and communication about the research that we do but also bringing people together to talk about these issues and I think for me one of the nicest things about this entire fortnight has been how many people have spoke passionately emotionally and with considerable care about the subject not just their professional role but also how it affects them personally and so it's my pleasure to bring in the panel for tonight which comes across from universe so welcome everybody so we're going to have a, a quick introduction because people do come at this subject from very different perspectives and i think for me the most revealing thing about cop26 is just how many disciplines speak to the subject this event is brought to you as part of the cop26 universities network and we've seen entire universities come together and build programs of activity around cop26 so i'm going to kick things off with with rosie who's in the bottom right of my screen so rosie just say a few words about what you do and how you come at this subject from your perspective hi good afternoon everyone and thanks andy um, so as andy said my name is rosie rosie anthony and i'm a lecturer in climate change and sustainability here at the university of salford a um, relatively new member of staff and it's really exciting, actually, my role to be in the geography and environmental management department and teaching students about climate change and the role that they can play in being the future activists. They're the future climate scientists. They're the people that are going to be affected most by climate change. And it's absolutely fantastic to see how engaged they are in this subject. Um, which is one of the things that I think has really come out of COP26, and I'm sure we'll get on to, is just how much more awareness there is now about the subject. And it's thrilling to be able to actually talk with and learn together with these young future scientists. Um, do you want us to talk about our research background here? Or is yeah, that say, say a few words. That'd be great, Rosie. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Um, so my research is based around carbon. So I'm sure you've heard quite a lot about carbon in relation to climate change and what role it has. Um, so I actually look at the amount of carbon that is stored in different parts of the ecosystem. So primarily my study uh, system has been orchards. So that means looking at the carbon that is stored in trees of different sizes, the soil and all that is associated with that ecosystem. So thanks, Andy. Fantastic. Thanks so much. And next, Ibukun, if you could do the same, please introduce yourself and say a bit about your perspective. Thank you very much, Andy. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be here today. Um, I work as a policy advisor on energy efficiency standards in the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Uh, I just thought to put that out there. My views today will be solely mine and will be solely about my perspective to COP26 and about my research. Okay, I have a background in energy, energy um, efficiency and um, um, environmental technology. So basically, um, over the last couple of years, I have been working on a research titles of an energy transition, which is specific focus on heat networks. Now, heat networks have been highly successful in other you know, European countries, such as Sweden, Denmark, and Helsinki, but it hasn't really contributed so much to the heat energy demand here in the UK. And we're my research is looking at how that transition can be made in terms of how we can build that, you know, market for it and, you know, establish that technology. Because according to um, the Committee on Climate Change, 18% of heat networks should make up the demand for um, um, heat if we're going to meet net zero cost effectively. So my research is looking at how that can be done and how, we, how um, advice can be given to 
policymakers and key stakeholders in the energy system such that they are able to make informed decision on how to move towards a green economy and how to drive you know um, that transition as cost effectively and as possible now just a brief you know intro about what heat networks are because someone might be wondering what are heat networks i've never even heard of this technology it is a technology that can access the otherwise you know tapped sources of energy from water from energy from waste from um solar from wind and from all sorts of you know sources that are inaccessible to other technologies for example you can get heat from you know um abandoned coal mines you can do that by having a heat pump and by channeling that into homes and ensuring that you know it's used and it's all in the concept of circular economy which has to do with you know reusing um, reducing consumption reusing recycling before disposal so it's it's in line with you know building a sustainable economy based on the natural resources we can also tap into geothermal energy which is energy in the ground so this is this is what my research is all about thank you that's fantastic. And I'm sure we'll get into these subjects in much more depth because, of course, energy is such a powerful and critical subject for COP26. So thank you very much. Uh, Nora, and over to you. Thank you so much, Andy. And I'm very happy to be here. And uh, the panel is great. I'm looking forward to the discussion as well. Um, for me, I my name is Nora Nheisham. I'm a researcher at um, um, the university and my role is actually related more to research. So I'm a researcher specifically on um, ignition projects, nature-based solutions, living lab. And basically the work that we do within the living lab is related to green infrastructure, um, including adding retrofitted solutions, uh, green walls, green roofs, uh, sustainable urban, urban drainage systems, and, and more solutions within existing urban structures. Uh, that has been quite successful within our installation on campus, and we're looking into how this could be taken forward um, on a bigger scale, on an urban scale. Uh, we're working with different partners as well, uh, and, and we, can, we can talk about collaboration as well in, in a bit. Um, I am an architect by background, so I, I have a little bit of spatial planning uh, as well as, as, a, as a, a personal research interest. And I'm looking for, within my own research, about um, uh, measuring climate uh, emergency effects on urban scale, so sea level rise and how that would affect urban economies and, and similar um, aspects. So it's a little bit between the green infrastructure and the urban scale of the climate emergency uh, effects. Um, yeah, so that's basically what I'm, I'm doing currently. Um, yeah. That's all for me. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Wonderful. And Graham, finally over to you. Oh, we're muted at the moment. Let me unmute you. There we go. Go for it. Oh, yeah. Hi, I'm Graham Sheriff. I'm a research, a research fellow, rather, in the School of Health and Society at Salford. And um, my research is around um, people's experiences of environmental sustainability. So it's kind of social science. Uh, social sciences treatment of sustainability issues and primarily the built environment as in housing and energy and then uh, active travel and other forms of transport so I look at for example um, uh, fuel poverty um, are people warm in their homes uh, is is heat and affordable and then at the same time are we able to transition to a affordable green heating system so the, the transition a kind of fuel poverty uh, resilient tr transition is very important. Side of, of my research is active travel, so looking at walking and cycling. Um, can we can we transition our cities in a way that is very inclusive, so people can get around easily in a way that's that's low polluting? That's partly about climate change, partly also about air quality and people being active and healthy. Uh, so it's kind of those, those those different issues, and climate change clearly runs through that um, and is a really important element of it. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And we may be joined by also by Dr. Claudia Trio, who's, who's uh, also working in architecture at the university, and hopefully she'll be joining us in a, in a few moments. But uh, Rosie, I may come to you because obviously so much of what we want to talk about is what's happened at COP26. And it's hard. I mean, we have to I suppose, focus on the conclusion initially and see 
how we think what we think about what's happened and how it's taken place so what were your sort of initial reactions to i suppose the closing and where we ended up thanks andy yeah that's quite a difficult one isn't it um so just to um reiterate what ibakun said earlier these are my views um so not my workplace views i think initially really disappointing um mm. i was hoping that we would have stronger terminology and some more um, definite commitments from the world leaders. Um, I actually really was disappointed in the lack of physical action. You know, we saw so many people arriving on jets, private jets, um, within country journeys. And I just think that, you know, we need to be leading by example now. And everybody needs to be making a difference and I think that our world leaders need to actually be making that change and making that example and that's just like the smallest starting point and so it was disappointing on that level very disappointing in terms of the outcomes yeah. but I am really hopeful you know I I try to teach my students that we have to have hope because it's the only way that we can go forward actually so, you know, it is hopeful that we started talking about fossil fuels. That was the first time that's been mentioned. It didn't go far enough, in my opinion. Um, we needed to have stronger language and for it to be changed at the very last minute due to pressure um, is incredibly disappointing. I just hope that we can actually make some progress. Um, I mentioned earlier about seeing the inspiring people that were actually outside of um, COP26. So all of the people that perhaps should have had a voice, you know, all of the um, activists who are there pleading on behalf of the general public, on behalf of indigenous communities who are actually being severely affected right now, you know, in far greater a way than we can actually probably imagine. Um, mm here in the UK. I was also incredibly disappointed by the lack of representation going on from um, talking about Indigenous communities and that's representation in all senses of different genders of different people um, but as I said we saw a lot more interest I think in this COP and that, that gives me hope that you know the general public I think are much more aware this time around so we think about the Paris agreement and I think it stems from that really you know people started to become um, excited and think maybe we difference and I think that now moving forward we can turn what was actually relatively disappointing outcomes into something positive mm. if we now actually let that you know spur us on as individuals to put that pressure onto yeah. the world leaders. Yeah. Well certainly seeing Alok Sharma in the closing session there you know, breaking down emotionally about the outcome was, I mean, it, so much work goes into these things, of course, but then obviously it was clearly, it was clearly apparent that the conclusions didn't go in the direction and the process didn't go in the, in the way that they had hoped. But uh, Ibukun, if I may come to you, because I think that certainly Rosie and some other people have talked about that sense of hope. And even, even in that closing session, when uh, Mr. Sharma did sort of break down and he got this sort of standing ovation by many people, um, it's really hard to have a sense of, of what happens in those rooms and how challenging it is. But, but what's your sense of how things went? Do you feel that same sense of, of hope? Do you feel disappointment? What do, what's your reactions initially? Um, as someone who likes to look at the positive side of life, unfortunately, I don't have so much at this point because I didn't feel that the urgency of the climate crisis and the fact that we need to start to, you know, have that immediate actions towards, you know, reducing carbon emissions, transitioning away from fossil fuels, I didn't feel that urgency was well communicated. I thought that it was still you know, a case of we're not, we're, we haven't, the urgency was not well communicated in mm -hmm. terms of the times we have, the immediate actions that need to be put in place, the, the fact that green finance also should be, you know, well communicated as to, you know, how 
underdeveloped economies will be able to make that transition because the cost of tackling climate change does not come cheap. It comes at a cost and it's at a very high cost. You know, we are, we're talking about transitioning away from fossil fuel that has built economies. And I can relate with the whole climate justice and, you know, um, um, conversations that, that are also held in terms of no economy has actually built itself without fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a fact. Let's establish that. So if you're telling underdeveloped economies to leave fossil fuel, which is reliable, cheap, and, you know, um, has, is, is ingrained in our, in our economic industrial um, production chains and all of that. It's ingrained in all our production chains. If you're going to tell them to leave that, then you have to provide the finance to leave that. Because, I mean, it's, it's gotten to a point where we need to face reality. Apart from the fact that we need green finance, we also need, you know, socio-technical systems. We need people. We need infrastructure. We need the technology. We need, and, and to listening to, at the very beginning, Maya Motley's um, speech was very, I think that was really sad. To think that just so many countries at the coastal lines mm. who are saying 2.5 is a death sentence. If you're going to continue on this pathway, it, it's a death sentence for, for, for the coming generation. So, I mean, do we have to really go that deep to, to convince people about the urgency of this change? I think I think it's the inhumanity of, of humanity because we are not we're 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 not seeing the effect it has on other people and we're thinking okay we once we are fine where we are we can we can live with it but we can't sadly and there's also the other aspect of economies that are oil producing I mean I come from a country who is one of the largest producers of oil but it's sad to say that some of these countries are not willing to let go of fossil fuel. And it's all in line of, okay, you cost it through the Industrial Revolution, and we are not letting go anytime soon because you built your economy with it, and we want to build ours. But national level solutions cannot solve a wicked problem like climate change. If we are going to achieve the, the reality, the, the, the targets that we have set, we have to collaboratively work together. And, you know, sadly, it just has to be a case of who's ready to go, who's joining this boat, who's ready to go, let's go. If you're not ready, that's okay. You might join along the line, but it's so sad that we, I mean, I saw some really um, gory pictures and images that I'm like, we should, we, do we have to get to this level to prove a point or to make a point that we really have to make this transition? I mean, we have countries who are just, you know, installing uh, coal power plants and, and mm -hmm. we are saying move away from it, but they are there just building it. So how do we, how do we get this immediate, action? how do we achieve this goal if we don't achieve it collectively? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think um, one of the reasons why we wanted to produce these within the ESRC Festival of Social Science is because it's such a complex, but critically, a problem of social science. It's how do we actually bring about change? How do we encourage people to see themselves as part of a global community in a way that has an impact on what their national governors do? And I think, uh, Nuran, coming to you, it's, it's something that I think is a really complex problem of, of trying to understand how to how to guide people nudge people encourage them or, or compel them into 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 social change what's your perspective on what you saw at, at cop 26 uh, i mean maybe those first, those final sessions particularly but um but maybe were there too many high expectations of what could be achieved and, and is it still as mr sharma said uh, a historic moment um well i do agree that i do agree with rosie that there was more more potential and more inertia for it, especially yeah. that the last COP was before COVID. So I would say that this COP has been definitely different. Um, however, there is there is this issue of commitment and transparency. Yeah. So if we have the pledges, but we don't have commitment from the countries, going back to what Ibukun mentioned, um, there will be a lot of stops and hurdles along the way because 
for example, so even if um, the U.S. and China, for example, they did mention that they wanted to start a uh, different a, a new pledge. However, well, for the U.S., they will need to go back to Congress, for example, and they will need to go through a lot of things in order to get this pledge approved. So whether it's good intentions or it's over promising, mm. that's something that will need commitment. And that goes for all the different countries. And again, going back to commitment and the priorities. So yes, for underdeveloped and, and developing countries, it would be very challenging to, to keep um, certain promises, um, especially with other a lot of other issues on the line and a lot of other priorities. Um, I would say that transparency is quite important as well, because then, well, I, coming from a background of architecture and urbanism, but at the same time, I've worked a lot on an international scale. Mm -hmm. So I've seen a huge difference between the international scale and the national scale here in the UK, for example. So I would say that the discussion and the level of discussion and the level of commitment within the UK is quite different from that internationally. Mm -hmm. So you would find that in, in some countries there are um, existing strategies for green infrastructure, for example, if we take that in as, as an example. But then how much of that is done on ground? So that is a different thing. So then it becomes a matter of taking those pledges through. Back to what Ibukun mentioned on the boat and who is really willing to. Um, I would say that there's definitely a lot of inertia, as I mentioned. But then it, it will need to be taken through. I mean, there this is a country level conversation, but then there are a lot of different scales that will need to go through. And if those mechanisms are not supported within the country and internationally, I think a lot of countries will at least struggle um, to get to those pledges. Um, yes. So maybe there would be a need for a different sort or um, a supplementary conversation where different levels are discussed because currently it's very good to have those pledges however we do need mechanisms to support them becoming reality um, thank you yeah. Yeah. yeah i mean we heard a lot about of course transparency in the in the last few days especially because of the way in which the conclusion came about and Mr. Sharma, of course, apologizing for that ma the manner in which it transpired. And I think at the same time, I, I, I saw him speak on uh, Andrew Marr, the uh, British television program on Sunday, talking about, and he mentioned that India and China will have to explain themselves. And I, I wondered, Graham, coming to you, it's a, uh, I think climate justice has been such a big part of this. And I wonder how much of a sense of injustice affects that inability to get the, the kind of changes that we we need. And as Nurhan has mentioned, that it's very hard to, to expect all nations to commit in the same way when they all start at very different points and also have a sense of historical injustice that's brought about by what's happened in those advanced nations that have managed to capitalise on the, on essentially the exploitation of natural resources. So, so yeah, what's your perspective on how you saw what happened and, and where you see the priorities at the moment? Yeah, and I mean... So I wasn't, um, I don't think I was shocked by the outcome of the conference, to be quite honest. I don't think I was expecting climate change to be solved by Saturday. Uh, I guess that would have been really good if we had this really real confidence that we're going forward and, and climate change was going to be was going to be banished. But um, I, don't, I don't feel kind of down about the result in a, in a sense that I feel I feel like there's, there's kind of some some if, if it's incremental, there's, there's change and there's agreement as acceptance of a need to move. Um, I also, I guess I don't expect, I, I agree with, with you, Ibukun, that, that we really need a kind of global coordination on this. But I also don't, I don't think it necessarily comes from these big meetings. There's so much that goes on in between the big meetings. Um, and there's probably some football metaphor here that I completely be incapable <laughs> of making about, you know, that it's not just the big tournaments, it's stuff in between. Mm. Um, or it's not just general elections, it's all the politics in between the general elections. And if you look mm. at something like the C40s network, which is cities trying to set a, a kind of, you know, trying to be beacons for climate change and show that they can they can reduce their emissions and they can do all the all these ambitious policies and then document them and then have discussions and, and show how other cities can follow. 
you know, I think that leadership there is really important as well. And that's outside of the of the COP, of, of the series of COPs. So in that sense, I'm quite positive that there's so much stuff going on in, in policy and research and, and, and at city level, uh, often at city level, sometimes at national level, that is global leadership as well. And I think that often does represent does kind of recognise that justice element to it that there's there's cities that are, uh, you know, that, that are showing that, that the global north needs to be leading the way, and I think I was quite disappointed at the kind of lack of recognition of the global north's responsibility uh, mm -hmm. during COP. That's something I was disappointed in, and I think that there just needs to be so much more recognition of that. There used to be a term called contraction and convergence, which I think has fallen out of um, of um, popularity a little bit. But the idea that you know that, that that some countries will have to be increasing their emissions, while other richer and more, uh, you know, more developed countries will be decreasing. And I think we've seen that with India, who, you know, saying that uh, they, they, I think they said they can't um, decarbonize till 2070, but they have said, and they've said that because, you know, they, they need to industrialize and enjoy some of the the, the gains we we will have from industrialization. Uh, but they have said, for example, that uh, they will have um, you know fifty percent renewable, uh, a fifty percent renewable grid by twenty thirty, which is actually quite a major thing. So there's you know that's, that's really positive. Um, so I don't I don't think it's kind of all doom and gloom. I think it's I also agree that it's really positive how much public kind of um, support there was for for strong action on climate change, but also mm. a bit depressing how much hypocrisy there was at the sort of leadership level. Um, and how many people were flying in on private jets and that kind of thing. Yes. I personally, I still don't understand why Leonardo DiCaprio was there. Uh, I think he came for one day to kind of look like, you know, to be part of that opening thing. Why Why does that happen? Yeah. I, I don't understand that at all. Anyway. I'll, I'll <laughs> well, I think it partly happens because those in control of those narratives around it believe that getting Leo Di Leonardo DiCaprio is a way of reaching out further. I mean, it's amazing to see how how much is given, to, how much space is given to what we describe as influencers today, as if that is the way to bring about sort of social change. Uh, Dr. Claudia Trio has just joined us as well, and welcome, Claudia. Claudia, we're just in the middle of of reactions to COP26 at the moment, and talking about some of the language, and uh, and so yeah, it'd be great to come to you in a moment, maybe just to say a few words about who you are and what you do and then perhaps just talk about some of your initial reactions. So far, people are quite optimistic and hopeful about the future, but disappointed, of course, by the outcomes. And, and I think we'll get into in a moment, I guess, what wonder how historic it was. Obviously, to have fossil fuels in the statements at the end was, was seen as historic and talked about as being monumental. Um, but we, of course, they the commitments haven't got us close enough to 1.5 degrees yet. So, so just a couple of few words about yourself and, and your reactions to COP at, at the moment. Yeah, thank you very much, Andy, for inviting me this evening. My name is uh, Claudia Trillo, and I am a reader in architecture at the University of Salford, but I am passionate about the environment since I was a child. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, what I teach uh, is um, um, often related to sustainability, sustainable architecture, uh, urban ecologies, and so on. And uh, yeah, I... Um, I didn't manage to follow up all the details of COP26 as I would have liked to do because of, uh, obviously, of uh, working commitments. But uh, overall, uh, um, I, I would have expected more, uh, more uh, a, 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 a different type of effort uh, compared to the challenge that we need to, uh, to tackle. And... Uh, uh, I also I am an optimistic by nature. I can't hide that, that uh, I definitely don't think that it has been done enough in COP26. I really hope that mm -hmm. uh, all this uh, momentum on uh, environment etc. won't uh, really hide the fact uh, that we would have needed uh, a kind of a more uh, def more, more kind of a uh, definite. A stronger shift uh, towards a transition, uh, which was a systemic 
And um, I, I don't think that uh, the, the way we are tackling the issue is really substantial, unfortunately. And uh, I, I really hope that uh, we don't start reaching the tipping points mm -hmm. and up to the point that uh, the situation goes out of control. But definitely, uh, I'm not happy with what happened. This seems mm -hmm. more folklore about environment than uh, substance. We, we are facing uh, a terrible challenge here and the reality is that in a hundred years uh, the hard earth <laughs> will mm. become inhabitable. I was just watching a movie last night, Elysium, which uh, at this point it seems to me the more likely dystopia mm -hmm. happening to the planet. I'm sorry to say that. So I think that we should have uh, seen something different from uh, as an outcome from this mm. uh, conference. I mean, yeah. I, I sort of I think a lot of people agree with that. And, and Rosie, I wonder, however, what success would have looked like. I mean, we know that the language of um, phasing out was was watered down to phasing down. Um, and, but I mean, what what do you think? I think the question that follows from that is what would success have looked like? Would that have been success? Would that have been enough to sort of appease people? Or, or do you think that it's always going to be a sort of incremental there's, there's going to be another number of cops before we get to 1.5. What's your sense of what success could have been? Um, I think it is always going to be incremental. And I think that, you know, we do have to take things step by step. Um, for me, I think it would have been more successful if there was some stronger commitment. So some actual action. Um, mm. Mr. Johnson has said how disappointed he was with some outcomes. So for me, really, success in terms of the UK would be for him to actually put an end to things like the new Cambo oil field. So currently there are plans in the pipeline for 40 new oil and gas fields in, the, in and around the UK. And that just can't happen in my mind. You know, we need to really be phasing out completely fossil fuel usage, particularly in countries like the UK. You know, we can put the fossil fuel subsidies into renewable technologies. So I think as a, a citizen, I would like, so rather than a scientist, I would like to see some actual commitments and action from the government to help everyday people be able to implement things as well. So it's a lovely idea and to have um, the move towards electric cars, for example, but how many people in the UK can afford an electric car, have the infrastructure for it? Do we have the infrastructure as a country? So for me, success at COP would have actually been stronger commitment um, to actual action. I think the only way forward, um, Norhan made a very good point about how COVID has happened. And for me, the only way that we can actually prevent getting to a tipping point, prevent, well, I think we're already at that tipping point, but preventing further um, spiralling down is to actually treat the climate emergency like an emergency. Mm -hmm. You know, we saw the world completely change last year. Y you wouldn't have imagined that everybody would stay in their homes because the government told them to, that we would be washing our hands and continually and wearing face masks, but people did it within hours because we were treating it like an emergency. So, you know, we can successfully save our planet. We can save communities. We can save the environment if we actually treat it like an emergency. Um, I think the most encouraging thing for me to come out of um, COP is actually the leaders have said, we are on track for 1.5, possibly, but it's hanging in there. It's on life support. Mm -hmm. And I think they're actually now starting to recognise that. Um, for me, success yeah. would be them acting upon that, but at least that recognition is there, which is possibly a step further than it has been. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's exactly right. I think it is always a, a balance between the expectations that things should happen overnight and an appreciation for how incremental and complex they are to change. So it's very easy to to stop doing something overnight, but then the impacts on a range of social settings, including, of course, places that are in nations that are still trying to build their, their own sort of sentient industrialization, have, have impacts. Ibukun, if I come to you for a moment, because I think that one of the one of the things I wonder is, I'm surprised that there isn't any nation that's come out and said, 
that despite it being watered down to phasing down, we're going to aim for phasing out. And I think that sort of strong statements from those nations that can do, um, I'm surprised we haven't seen that yet because uh, like, like Rosie said, there's so much more that those those countries that are already quite advanced can actually do. But, um, but were you also sort of said, did you also feel that there was um, a, a lack of commitment? Do you think there was a lot more that could have been said or, or how much? Because I think one of the things that I'm struggling with is trying to understand what happened in those final sort of hours, really, where where the wording changed. I mean, was it down to, do you think, simply inadequate sort of compensation or financial packages for those developing nations? Was it something that just there wasn't enough finance to, to help people get a leg up or was there something else going on? Thank you, um, Andy. I'm actually not surprised, to be honest. Mm. I I wasn't surprised that it was going to be watered down because the, and this is because of greed, really, mm. largely because of greed, because these economies understand the the commercial, um, the commercial value of fossil fuel, and they're not willing to let go. I mean, this is something that, you know, I mean, for countries who, you know, are into exporting fossil fuel, they understand that they're making money from this. And yeah. most of this, sadly, most of these first world countries have investments in this, you know, channels of production. So it's, it's largely born out of greed, capitalism, commercial aspects in terms of, you know, um, being able to, get that you know profit i mean we all know that you know clean energy technology is not quite there you know we we, we need to in order to beef it up to where you know fossil fuel infrastructure and all of that is right now we need to spend a lot of money and you know these people are not willing to pass with money they will rather make money rather than lose money or invest in a new technology so it's all born out of greed. It's all born out of, you know, that's that's um, that sense of I I don't want to, you know, I am I'll rather take the risk on climate change rather than you know put things in order. I mean, just because some people in different different parts of the earth are facing climate change does not mean I can't take the risk. I'm making money and I'm successful. You know, why would I want to, you know, um move away from fossil fuel. And another concern I have is greenwashing. Yeah. I am worried that some industries and economies will start to put out false claims about carbon reduction, you know, false claims about environmental benefits. You know, it's it's our, our product is you know energy efficient, is you know, it's almost as if when you see that on the label, you want to buy it. You know, when you see oh eco-friendly all of that you want to buy it but what is the metrics how has it been measured that this product reduces x amount of carbon emissions in the atmosphere we we don't know how is it measured what is we, we are not sure of all these things so i can come up to you and say oh my product is environmentally friendly all of that i mean i'm, I'm beginning to think that that's what's going to play out eventually because this industries and these economies and this you know big names will come out and say oh we are, eco we are environmentally friendly you know this but there is no actual measure you know when you say you create smart goals specific measurable how do you measure it that is a key um ingredient in achieving your goals if you're going to say you want to get to a particular point you should be able to measure your progress towards net zero right measure your progress towards 1.5 we need to have accountable metrics that, okay, but I'm not saying prescriptive solution because that was type of innovation, but it should be measurable. And we need to start, you know, helping SMEs transition to green economy by providing the adequate finance as, also, as well as, you know, being able to measure what the carbon emissions have been as well. That's what I think. It's uh, really interesting to hear that, Graham, because I think one of the things we talk about is how you how you bring about social change, either from the bottom up or the top down. And uh, certainly, I know the event that you hosted last week of on the uh, on Motherlode the movie. You see this really strong sense of a of a social movement that is sort of 
giving up their their vehicles and cars and, and moving into cargo bikes and, and alternative forms of transport. Do you see more of that? I mean, do you, and do you think that's sort of the way that change has to happen? It has to happen from the bottom up to create that sort of tipping point and transformation? Or, I mean, it's always a combination, of course, but do you think that's a powerful way to bring it about? Yeah, I think, I mean, absolutely. I mean, what we do has to change. The question is how, how that happens. And I think there's there's always going to be a, a, some change that comes about kind of organically that people say, I really want to start cycling to work, so I'm going to do that. Sometimes it's for, you know, environmental reasons. Often it's for you know, taking exercise or it's convenient or, you know, it's fun. Um, but I think what we need then is that leadership that, that that's committed to making that possible for more people, making it a good option for more people. And that means sort of, you know, transforming our cities so there's more cycle lanes more you know safe walking routes more uh high quality public transport and i think that's what's that's what's missing for me from these global conversations is is what it actually looks like for you know, for, for people for people generally in, in cities and towns and in, in, in villages you know what what does it actually look like and i think sometimes with the big global discussions you sometimes lose that and you end up talking about something quite abstract which is you know 1.5 degrees or 2.4 degrees and that that's quite hard to, to grab onto really to, to know what that means in, in terms of you know actual actual change in what we do. So I I find that a little bit frustrating with the conference as sort of that there's, there's there's a lack of vision in terms of what it actually means. And but I guess that's the nature of a global conversation. But you're right, you need you, you need to say we're gonna put money into invested in cities to give them the resources to to make an environment in which people can change and want to change. I think that's absolutely right. We've got a comment uh, from Jerry, who's on YouTube, talking about how difficult it is to make sense of some of these things that we need to transform. And I think that the financial transformation is a, is a massive one for people to get to grasp, to grips with. I, I watched some of the sort of concluding uh, plenary sessions and and even just following a lot of the language and understanding the technicalities of the legal legal environment in which these changes takes place is incredibly difficult. But um, But trying to make sure that people... I suppose understand the scale of the change that they need to make in their lives is already a, a big challenge. I know that there were sessions in, in COP26 that were dedicated to trying to think about how to move certain people in, in a direction of, of more sustainable living. Claudia, I wonder when you think about, I guess, architects and how they, they think about urban planning and, and construction, I, I suppose the other side of that is the industry and how the industries that are involved with utilizing natural materials are also changing. Do you have a sense that the industry is moving alongside these sort of um, expectations or is there still essentially an economic bottom line and the use of materials falls really quite squarely in, in, in those parameters? Do you, uh, do you think that people are making a change at the industry side of things? Well, this is a very good uh, question and I guess uh, it's um, I, I haven't done any specific research on these so I would go more with what I see around based on my experience and so on. So I couldn't be more in agreement uh, than with what uh, Ibukun said regarding the greenwashing. Unfortunately, there are some, um, uh, some, uh, some in, there is a part of the industry which is uh, using environment just uh, to literally greenwash uh, all the stuff, rebranding it and selling it uh, uh, without really making any, any difference. I can see exactly the same products uh, just rebranded and uh, portrayed uh, as uh, uh, the, the solution. Uh, obviously, this is not the case. Um, uh, however, I'm not 100% sure that uh, measuring is the right way because uh, the reality is that I don't believe in models more than what they are. So models are a way for us to, to try to make sense of the reality, but they can also be easily manipulated. And uh, in reality, sometimes a little bit of extra common sense uh, could help. So rather than uh, making uh, um, um, a plethora of uh, new assessment models and calculations, uh, possibly we should really 
go back to the to the basics of environmental planning my hero remains a young card and the book um, design with nature which was written in the, end of the 60s for me remains the bible there was no uh, real, real measurement in that book but at the end of the day what we do want are proper green belts proper trees in the uh, in the city proper uh, soil of good quality and uh, we want uh, proper vegetation in the cities uh, to keep the heat islands uh, under control. We want uh, to avoid uh, soil sealing uh, so that uh, the ground can absorb the water and uh, we do want uh, the, uh, the, the, the assets of the planets like Amazon being properly preserved. That's what we need. So at the end of the day, my pledge would be, let's come back to a little bit of a common sense, uh, even in planning, uh, in architecture. Otherwise, the risk that uh, obviously the part of the industry, which doesn't really care about the environment, but only cares about making more profit, we just make more profit out of the greenwashing. So I'm, as I said, unfortunately, I don't have a proper research on that, but I think that we know what we have to do. We don't need any extra research. The mm -hmm. basics of environmental planning and sustainable architecture are there and possibly traditional architecture was much more sustainable than contemporary architecture. There is also a very good book that is um, uh, now available. The title is Low Tech and is all about uh, indigenous architecture and how the solution to um, a more resilient architecture sometimes is in indigenous culture rather than mm. in high tech. Mm, interesting. And uh, Nurhan, we have um, a lot of this is thinking about how we can, uh, and you heard this a lot at COP26, how we calculate the benefits of green infrastructure and, and trying to get, it, get that through in policy terms. What's your perspective on that? How do you sort of see these things being connected? So basically, to continue on what Ibukun and, and Claudia mentioned, yes, we do have to have measurable um, measurable uh, outputs and we do have to understand what different people are gaining out of this. So, for example, um, from the scale of an, a house owner to the scale of university to the scale of um, GMCA, for example, or local authority, we need to understand who would benefit what and whether this is financeable or not. Mm. Um, but then this is a different level of conversations than, than the pledges in COP. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I'll give you an example of what we're doing at the Living Lab and within the Ignition Project as well, which is basically trying to measure that. We're basically trying to do that, is to say that these kinds of green infrastructure, if we add them to this building, we will get this kind of benefit. And this kind of benefit can translate to that kind of economy or saving or um, financial case. And accordingly, we can start ta taking these um, calculable measurements to the public, taking mm -hmm. them to investors, taking them to uh, Amazon, like, like Claudia mentioned. So for example, Amazon uh, warehouses are literally everywhere. So imagine if Amazon wanted to have more green infrastructure and to be net zero. So that would make a huge effect in the UK and around the globe, just one, one company. But this is the, the scale that we need to take it to, to the scale of implementation. <laughs> and yes, models or computer models or simulated models are not, are not they're guiding, but yeah. they're not completely accurate because there is a lot that happens on ground that we need to, to anticipate and to work with. Um, well, the lip, constructing the living lab, for example, was quite, quite different from what we had on paper. So there was a lot of considerations that we had to go through, including, for example, policies and the finance of it. So it's very easy to say that, yes, green infrastructure, for example, would add a lot of benefit. But how much is that benefit? Mm. And according to, for example, what kind of green wall would you want as a homeowner? rather than if you want it as a university, because you might not have the same capital and you might want a more sustainable, um, longer term, um, uh, even if it's an incremental benefit. So those kinds of arguments are the, the ones that need to be taken 
they are happening in the UK, honestly. That is a lot of effort happening on a lot of different scales, um, DEFRA and um, the EA and a, a lot of different scales of intervention and collaborations are happening and with the local authorities as well. Um, Salford City Council, where, where we're based, all of us, it's actually quite active on the green agenda. But then maybe that is not the case in other countries. So then mobilizing those efforts and making sure that we translate those efforts that are done in, in leading countries in green infrastructure and in net zero um, agendas, this, this is a conversation that needs to be had. Yeah. Because, yeah. because otherwise those mechanisms or other countries cannot, maybe they cannot have the same resources placed for developing mechanisms. Yeah. So maybe that's something that would add to COP, is to make sure that whatever we have in terms of efforts are shared with everybody, mobilizing mm -hmm. not only um, uh, collaborations, but rather mobilizing the techniques and mechanisms. We're far from perfect. Let, let me just <laughs> mention that as well. There is a lot to be done on, on policies, for example, and, and on developing new, new technologies. But the UK is definitely on the way on that. I mean, it's really interesting to hear that because it made me think about how we often sort of try two different approaches to thinking about these matters sociologically. One is to talk about the kind of economic benefits that may come to a nation that bring about new kinds of new kinds of industries, new kinds of economies. But then we also talk about the, the sort of inherent value or transformative value to our lives and the quality of that. And and um, and Beck, Becca, who's part of our sustainability team, has has asked a question about the sort of bottom up approaches. And because we've seen a lot about not just changing because it's financially better, but because returning to nature can improve your quality of life as well. And Rosie, I want to sort of bring you in here because obviously working with students and getting them to work on campaigns around climate action is, I think, reasonably described as a sort of bottom up approach to things. And, and I wonder whether you think there have been sort of particularly exciting or really fascinating moments of that sort of bottom up movement. Obviously, the ones we see particularly are the ones that involve people like Greta Thunberg, which I think it's easy to sort of forget that there is a bottom up element to to what she does and which of course has now become a, a global phenomenon with a lot of a lot of structure around it but uh, but what did you sort of notice around cop that you think characterizes that bottom-up approach to social change absolutely i think for me um actually to go back to greta thunberg and what i think the underlying thing here is is education so i think the biggest thing that greta has actually done for the climate change movement is educating people and raising awareness, which is actually the most important thing because we're talking about this bottom up versus top down. And in reality, we need both. We need to have the funding and the policies from the top, but we actually need the pressure from the bottom to make that happen, I think. And the only way to have that pressure from the bottom is if everybody is aware of the reality mm -hmm. and seriousness and the emergency that there is um, so that they can then put the pressure on. So there are so many, um, you mentioned the word influencers um, earlier um, when we were talking about Leo, but actually there are so many great climate influencers as well. Some really great youngsters um, from all over the world, from different nations, and they're experiencing climate change firsthand yeah. and they are educating people around the world. And um, so I think social media can be a really dangerous place, but it can also be fantastic for sharing these experiences and educating people. Um, and also to come back to the point that Ibukun made earlier um, about greenwashing, I think, yes, it's a huge problem that we don't really have time to get into, but one of the main um, solutions to it is actually to, again, educate people because we underestimate people sometimes. And, you know, that people do have common sense. And if they know what they're looking out for, you know, they know that these big companies who are claiming that their clothes are much more environmentally friendly when actually in reality they're not paying their workers a fair wage or even on a smaller scale, they're not recycling cardboard waste from their shop. The general public, if they're made aware of this and they are educated, then they will 
be able to make their own decisions and then we can start driving that policy change and having that effect um so i think um in reality we need to have both that bottom up and top down approach working together to actually make a difference that's a fantastic sentiment rosie thank you very much and we are actually onto a round of sort of closing statements so that seems like a good a good one from you rosie and i wonder Ibukun, how would you follow that what's your sort of closing statement and perhaps that reaction to the bottom up approach Okay, um, like Rosie said, I think we definitely need a mix of both, um, bottom up, top top down. It, it would be nice to have, you know, the influx of, um, you know, ideas from the the general public as well as, you know, the, the government in terms of, you know, working together in order to come up with viable solutions that will, that are well thought through and are logically um, inclined to, helping the interest or putting the interest of all stakeholders you know in view as as we move towards um, net zero but um speaking on you know you know there's a lot that has been said about finance i disagree that if we have the funds to transition to clean energy technology and to if you have the funds needed to t tackle climate change we will mm -hmm. do the right thing I, I am not convinced that is finance is not the only problem we have. If we had the, 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 the money that we needed, the finance that we needed to drive this change, we might not still get it right. Mm -hmm. Because we need to build a balance of social and technical systems. And that has a lot to do with cultural change. People need to start seeing things differently. People need to start you know, reducing their consumption of energy. You know, there's a lot of, you know, on, on how do I put it, irresponsible consumption and production. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, you know, um, policies that needs to be put in place. There are people, strategic people in leadership that need to come together to, to, to put out the ideas in such a way that will make sense to people who have big following, for example. So the infrastructure as well. Now, I, I drive by my house and I have nothing less than three filling stations, uh, gas stations, you know, just around the corner. What's going to happen to those infrastructure? What are we going to do with them? Are we going to turn them to charging points for for um, electric vehicles? What are we going to do to that? When we start to dismantle fossil fuel structures, when we start to diversify, it sounds like a really interesting word, but that is exactly what we need to do. When we start to put up policies in place and, you know, and regulation that will drive that because People would, would not, you know, compliance and enforcement is also something that needs to be put in place in order for us to see the change that we require. And of course, putting goals and the metrics in place in order to ensure that we measure how much we are moving towards our, our targets. Yes, mm. thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, that sentiment around sort of the, the way in which we excessively consume or have historically excessively consumed, particularly natural resources, was, of course, the sentiment expressed by India's environment minister. Claudia, I wonder what your sort of closing statement is. What's your state? How would you sort of see the, the sort of next step for us and where we need to be going? Uh, well, it's a it's a it's a hard just uh, to try to wrap up uh, so much. Uh, um, I mean, it's, 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 but I will try to to express this in form of yeah sentiment. Like uh, uh, I think that uh, we should uh, enter all of us. We should enter in a different mood. Uh, if we are facing an emergency, we need to be prepared to change our lifestyles. This could be for the better, but uh, there are going to be things uh, that we will no longer be able to do. As well as uh, during the COVID, uh, we, we were so much constrained uh, in our lifestyle and we managed uh, to survive <laughs> to so many constraints. I think that we should enter in the same mindset. So we are in a climate emergency. Everybody has uh, his own bit to do. And we can't keep on doing the things uh, the same way we used uh, to do before. And this applies to all the sectors, to architecture. To I was very, very um, uh, interested in seeing the reaction of uh, uh, Foster 
to uh, the um, the tulip uh, skyscraper. I mm -hmm. think that not everybody has understood the situation in which we are and that we all need to make a change to the way in which we think. Hopefully when this happens, then we will be uh, optimistic uh, with good reasons. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. And Nora, and over to your final sort of statement as to what you would hope for going forward. Um, I, I would say that we are on the right path, but it's whether we commit to it and continue with it mm. is what matters and how much we continue on that path. Um, there is definitely need for more, more on different levels. Um, yes, it's COP, but like Graham mentioned, it's COP and everything in between. <laughs> um, so it has to be on different levels. It has to be it has to be the students and, and the, the change in culture and education. And it has to be the research as well. Mm -hmm. So for example, in order to get to more information, in order to be a more informed global society, basically, about climate change, we need to have numbers. And those numbers can be gotten only through research. We need to understand that through more investment in climate emergency. That is happening, but it needs to happen even more and, and it needs to be connected to policy. So even with the research that's going on, we do need a lot of policy to support this. Mm -hmm. um, and that's on, on all countries, not only within the UK. There is always a gap between technology and policy. Um, and, and that's like, we can literally say Facebook <laughs> and, <laughs> as an example, but like, there, there is a gap and we need to, to start seeing that policies need to catch up in order to support that. Um, and well, the communities will will come, come along bit by bit, but we need to make it um, attractive for them. We need to make, to make climate uh, adaptation and mitigation attractive through financing, through the benefits, through uh, cultural change, as Ibuku mentioned, but it has it has to be quite um, it has to be quite comprehensive. It is a bottom up and a top uh, and and the other way around as well. But it it has to be everybody working together on it. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, mean, I, I would so. say that we're there, but we're almost there. But we need to continue as well. Well, sustaining sustainability seems like a crucial message to keeping it going. Graham, your final word, please. Yeah, well, there has to be there has to be top down, there has to be bottom up approaches that they, they have to meet in the middle. I think too often the top down approaches are saying to people, don't drive to work or get a new boiler. But that's not going to happen if you, you know, if you don't invest in really good public transport and walking and cycling facilities. And if you don't give people support to upgrade their boilers and improve their homes. So you need that from the government and you, you need leadership. And Leonardo DiCaprio has to do all this as well. <laughs> <laughs> definitely <laughs> well thank you all we are running slightly over time so i want to bring it to a close but thank you all so much for being here i've learned a great deal and really appreciate your perspectives and uh, as i say i'm sure we will at salford university keep this conversation going and, and make sure that we do as much as we can in between the cops as they continue to take place so thank you again for being here and thank you all for watching please do complete our form if you haven't already just to let us know what your experience has been like you can see it in the chat so i'll say Good night to everyone and thanks for joining. Thank you. Bye everyone.